Good morning. Welcome to everyone. Apologies for the sound on, on that video, um, but delighted to have so many of you. I can see the numbers um, going up, so many of you online um, today. And I want to really welcome you to this exclusive event. My name is Kate Bora, and I am the president of Chartered Accountants Australia New Zealand. And I'm delighted to be able to introduce you today to our moderator and expert panel who will join us to discuss what this election year budget will mean for you, your clients, and of course, for our nation. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and recognise their continued connection to land, water and community. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. As I said, we've had nearly 5,000 people register for today's session and of course the numbers keep going up, so fantastic to have so many of you online for today's live conversation and of course um, to those who will listen into the recording. Um, it's terrific to see such a strong level of interest in discussing how the budget will impact you, your businesses, and of course, the important role our profession will play in leading an enduring economic and business recovery. We have the pleasure of being in conversation today with Walkley award-winning journalist, Paul Kelly, who will be known to many of you as the editor-at-large on The Australian. Paul was previously editor-in-chief of The Australian and now writes and commentates on Australian politics, public policy and international affairs, appearing regularly on Sky News, as well as being the author of seven books on political events here in Australia. We're delighted to have you on board, Paul. Also on our panel are three of our very own CA tax and superannuation, superannuation experts. Uh, firstly, Australian tax leader, Michael Croker, CA, who leads CAANZ's taxation policy and advocacy work with federal and state governments and regulatory bodies. Welcome, Michael. Our senior leader in superannuation and financial advice, Tony Negline, CA, who has over 30 years experience in the financial services industry and is the author of the Essential SMSF Guide, now in its 11th edition. And Diana Youssef, CA, head of tax at Bega Cheese, but will be speaking today as a representative of the CAANZ's tax technical committee. Prior to joining Bega, Diana spent more than 11 years at professional services firms such as PwC and Deloitte working on complex tax matters across a range of industries. Thank you for joining us, Paul, Michael, Tony and Diana. Today's discussion will be moderated by CAANZ's senior tax advocate, Susan Franks. Susan is an experienced policy advisor and commentator, providing insights to government and political stakeholders to help shape tax policy and administration and strengthen the voice of the profession. Thank you, Susan. I'll now hand over to you to open up the discussion. Well, thank you, Kate. Well, during today's session, the live chat function will be open for the audience to post comments and engage in the conversation. The audience will also have the opportunity to ask questions of our experts. If you'd like to post questions, please use the Q&A box and ensure that you pick panel and attendees so that fellow attendees can see your question and understand its context as the panelists respond to it. As we won't have the chance to address all your questions today, please take a moment after the session to visit the Chartered Accountants Federal website hub for our expert commentary and analysis. Today's session will be recorded and made available to the wider membership through the Chartered Accountants website. For that reason, all members will be muted so that no identifiable details will be published as part of this recording. To begin this conversation, I'd like to invite Paul Kelly to provide some opening remarks about his view of the budget that was delivered last night. Paul. Good to be with you all. I've called this a we listen and we care Liberal Party pre-election budget. I believe Treasurer Josh Frydenberg has got the balance between the economics and the politics better than many people expected he would. But judgments on this will of course vary. This is a budget framed in the political and economic centre ground. It won't reverse the government's 54-45 polling deficit, but it gives the government a fighting chance to put the economy front and centre of the election campaign. At best, it could make the government competitive. The government will introduce legislation probably today to legislate the three main cost of living measures, and I expect the Labor Party will support this relief 
for households, taxpayers and motorists. Despite Labor's strong critique of the budget, there will be agreement between the government and the opposition on most of the cost of living policy relief steps. This reinforces my argument about the coming election. There are no fundamental ideological conflicts between the government and Labor, and the actual policy differences are less than we see at most election campaigns. How should we judge the treasurer's trade-off between the economics and the politics? Let me offer two comparisons. First, in the five years from 2021, the budget forecasts extra revenue of 142 billion, with 39 billion going in tax and spend decisions and 103 billion going to the bottom line. Another comparison comes in the 22-23 financial year. Total extra revenue is 38 billion, with nearly half, 17 billion going on tax and spending relief, and the rest going to the bottom line. Now, there are two views on this trade-off. Many economists will correctly object. With a strong economic recovery, robust consumer spending, rising inflation, and high budget deficits, there is no justification for these extra fiscal outlays. This economic proposition is true, but the political realist in me says that with the government facing an election in less than two months and trailing in the polls, it was untenable to think Frydenberg and Scott Morrison would not bring down significant cost of living assistance. The main measures total about 8.6 billion. That includes the six month fuel excise cut, the bonus tax rebate of $420 for 10 million uh, low and middle income earners, and the $250 cost of living payment for 6 million people. Frankly, this largesse could have been far worse and more significant. The key ministers have, have said to me privately, we needed to show in this budget that we are listening. We needed to show people that we've heard their pain and we care about it. The government wants to get an electorate dividend greater than the fiscal injection quantum it actually provides. And that quantum, of course, is limited by the inflation risks and the knowledge that the Reserve Bank will lift interest rates during the year. The government did the right thing, making this support temporary. But whoever wins the election faces the ugly prospect of seeing it withdrawn with all the political backlash involved in that. For me, the key dynamic in the budget, economic and political, is the labour market and the transformation it represents. Australia emerges from the pandemic with, only, with employment 3.1% above the pre-pandemic level, a result unmatched by any other advanced economy. Unemployment is forecast to fall to 3.75% in the September quarter and stay there for a couple of years, the best result for half a century. Treasury says its labour market predictions indicate there has been no long run scarring impact from the pandemic and recession. That's an extraordinary outcome. It's the strong labour market feeding into growth, jobs and strong tax revenues that buttresses the budget bottom line. Treasury is optimistic the economy can be driven harder. Drawing upon strong commodity prices and the benefits of employment, it projects a 103 billion improvement in the budget deficit across the forward estimates. And in a decade, it predicts the deficit will be down to 0.7% of GDP. That is a big improvement on last year's forecasts. This Treasury optimism on the forecasts is sure to be contested. Indeed, it is tempting to see the budget as suggesting our 10-year projections mean that Australia can recover its fiscal position without substantial new economic reform. Now, of course, that's not the intended measure. The reality, however, is that the budget does not address fiscal consolidation by spending cuts, 
the strategies to get there by economic growth. Indeed, spending is entrenched at permanently new higher levels throughout the decade, running at 26.5% of GDP at the end of the decade. This is significantly above pre-pandemic spending levels. It means the Liberal Party is pledged to fund big new social programs, programs in health, the NDIS, and rising defence and national security costs. The Liberals are no longer the party of small government and limited spending. If, as some economists predict, the budget will still need savings of $40 billion annually to get back into the black, there is no concession to this in the budget. While there is an emphasis on skills and a return to immigration over time, there is a little productivity enhancing economic reform in this budget. The days of big bang reform are long gone. They won't return. The best we can expect is incremental progress. The budget predicts gradual increases in real wages, with wages rising three and a quarter percent in 22-23 against a CPI of 3%. That is a very modest increase in real wages, and it comes off the back of not insignificant real wage falls in recent years. Wages remain a structural problem for the economy, for Australia's living standards, and Labor will make hay with it. This is a budget for the times. It's cautious, given a battered and risk-averse public. There's little reform audacity, but there is a stunning jobs story. We face an election campaign where the government and Labor will denounce each, each other in order to conceal the extent of policy overlap between them. Labor will have five items in its election policy agenda. Clean energy, the digital economy, advanced manufacturing, skills, and multinational tax. Whichever side wins the election will not have a mandate for significant reform in the, in the next term. So let's hope Treasury's optimism with these forecasts is more than justified. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And we've had a few comments coming through in the chat. I mean, the government is certainly being very upbeat and um, about the economy, saying it has recovered strongly and it doesn't need as much support at, at the moment. And it is relying on economic growth being greater than the interest rates to reduce debt as a percentage of GDP over time. A few people have raised um, whether using the reduced unemployment rate is enough in the economic environment, given the rate of un underemployment. And I suppose that's really raising the question, whilst the government's optimistic, do you think the Australian public share the same confidence? I think one of the points to make here is that there is a tension, almost a contradiction, between the macro figures in the economy and in the budget, which look pretty good. Certainly the macro figures in last night's budget look good if you believe the Treasury forecasts. So you've got that story on the one hand, but on the other hand, you've got what I call the lived economic experience of the Australian public. What households are feeling, and essentially households have gone through a very difficult time with the COVID pandemic, really significant disruptions to the way people live, to their work, to their education, the way they look after their kids, their concern about health, being able to get hold of the um, uh, proper uh, tests to um, uh, check on whether or not they've got COVID. And of course, we've then had the natural disasters, the fires and the floods, and um, wage levels, of course, have been compressed compared to prices. So there's uh, a cost of living problem and there's an overall living standards problem. So you do have this conflict between the economic uh, macro numbers on the one hand 
and what I call the lived experience of the Australian people on the other. Now, one of the fundamental questions is, will the budget be able to reconcile um, these two different realities? And that's what the government is working on. That's why I called it a budget as far as the government is concerned, that is, that is about the idea that we listen to your concerns, we care about your concerns, and we are investing in them with cost of living measures. Measures which are nonetheless uh, reasonably uh, constrained in terms of the overall situation of the budget. I think uh, this is a difficult environment for the government. The government is a long way behind in the polls. Labor is significantly ahead at the moment. As I said in my presentation, I think the best the government can expect of this budget is to become competitive again and to enshrine the economy as the central issue. But the budget alone won't save the government. The point I'd make is everything depends on the election campaign. And remember, the election campaign will see further promises and further spending. Mm. Yes, I've heard some people have suggested that um, it's a budget for 40 days rather than 40 years to um, get through the election. And you're seeming to indicate that uh, even though they are trying to address people's concerns about the costs of living, it may not be actually targeting the right people in the right way at the moment. Is that your thoughts? Well, I think it's... I think it's targeted fairly well. It's targeted very much to uh, middle Australia, to low income earners, but they've they've opened the lens very wide here um, uh, in terms of um, middle Australia, in terms of motorists, uh, the two car families, uh, pensioners. Um, so uh, they're really trying to uh, send the message that we are looking after a wide and significant range of the Australian electorate. The key point to make is the measures are temporary. Now, that's good. That's good. Now, you can criticise the government and, and say, oh, well, this is just a short-term election fix. Well, that's true. But it's far better to have temporary measures like this than permanent measures that will do um, a long-term damage to the budget. So I think we've got to recognise that um, given that the government was inevitably going to bring down these short-term assistance measures, it's good that they are temporary. So one of the questions is, how will people respond? Um, so here, I guess the first question is, will people notice the improvement? Well, I think they will. And secondly, though, uh, will people thank the government or simply pocket the improvement and move on. And I think one of the interesting features about this election is that a large proportion of the electorate is disengaged. And I think a significant number of voters will not make up their mind until the final 72 hours before voting, and a number won't make up their mind until voting day itself. So there's going to be a factor of ongoing unpredictability and uncertainty. And I know that both sides, both Liberal and Labor, um, with different expectations, of course, are looking to the last two to three days when if the government's got any chance, that's when it's going to recover. And that's exactly what happened at the 2019 election. So, Paul, are those undecided voters, um, mainly the younger voters, who may be concerned about after years of hearing about the need to get back in the black, that um, they may be left with debt in the future because there's no plan apart from um, hoping that productivity is greater than um, the inflation rate to reduce the debt? If we look at the uh, voting trends, I'd make two points here. Uh, the main voting schism is determined by age. And that is, if you, take, if you take a line through the electorate around about age 35, under 35, and particularly under 30, that's where... Um, uh, the Labor Party uh, and the Greens are polling very, very strongly. That's the government's area of weakness. If you then take a, a line through um, um, the age of the community, so 45 or 50 above, that's where the government is far stronger. Um, there's also a problem for the government with uh, educated professional women, um, particularly women in a number of leafy 
uh, safe um, coalition seats or supposedly safe coalition seats. And that's where the voices of movement focused on climate change is going to be particularly important. When we talk about voters making up their mind at the end, I think we're talking about those people significantly disengaged from the political debate and political process. People who are not following politics. Essentially, a lot of people following politics have got very firm views and they've made up their mind. But there's another significant minority in the electorate that are not following politics, that are not following the political media, and that will make up their mind according to a lot of uh, uncertain and quite unpredictable factors towards the end. Thank you very much, Paul. Diana, um, the government has indicated on numerous occasions that it wants a business-led recovery. As someone who's working with business, what are you and your peers experiencing? Is business actually ready to lead the recovery at the moment? Well, thanks, Susan, and good morning, everyone. Um, I guess just to start off, I don't think that business has expected a lot out of the budget, um, given the upcoming election. Um, I do think that there are mixed feelings from um, the business community regarding the budget. The question is always, could more have been done to support businesses, whereas this is more a business as usual type of budget, I would say. Um, I guess in terms of lived experience, you know, we are living through unprecedented times and a lot of disruption, which businesses are trying to navigate through and emerge even stronger, more innovative and grow. Um, so businesses are dealing with a skills shortage, which puts pressure on production. Um, it is interesting because as Paul's already mentioned, we have um, the lowest unemployment rate um, and it's predicted to continue downward in the September, qu September quarter um, to be the lowest in almost 50 years. Um, female participation and unemployment is also the lowest it has been since 1974. And a lot of people are familiar with the term the great resignation. And in business, we are seeing a lot of movement um, which means there is also a lot of recruitment. So people are asking a lot more um, and getting it due to the labour shortages. But, you know, I guess the question here is, is this really translating to real wage growth? Um, and the labour shortages, you know, put, put strain on businesses, particularly when we're dealing with a level of absentee, absenteeism due to COVID-19, which potentially could increase as well as we head into winter. Um, with, again, another strain potentially of COVID and, and just um, in general. Um, I guess, um, you know, most companies I would expect are still budgeting a level of absenteeism into their budgets and still a level of cost, although at a reduced level as we're learning to live with COVID-19. Um, and, you know, these costs range from rat tests, staff costs, indirect effects such as um, reduction in productivity, um, which impacts the bottom line, um, you know, increasing freight, shipping costs, fuel, increasing commodity prices, or putting a large strain on businesses. So it is inevitable that these increases in cost will be passed on to consumers with um, increased product prices predicted to be anywhere between 10 to 20 percent. Um, you know, again, I think it's already been mentioned around drought, fire, floods, or putting pressure on businesses and supply chains, um, as well as the people who are affected in those areas. Geopolitical tensions as well, also affecting business and consumer sentiment, but also increasing prices, again, with the cost of fuel. Um, but hopefully with the temporary reduction in the fuel excise, this will assist businesses, at least in the short term. Um, I guess, um, you know, probably um, one of the main things that Josh Feinberg quoted in his speech yesterday was that small family businesses employ nearly 8 million Australians. So I think this budget, if you are a small business, um, you'll be happy with some of the measures, uh, such as the additional 20% deduction for expenditure incurred on eligible external training and costs incurred on business expenses and depreciating assets that support digital adoption. Um, there are other small you know, business cash flow boosts and other um, factors that should assist small business as well. Um, I guess one of the positive things that we, that we saw um, was the expansion of the paint and box regime. Um, 
to agricultural and technologies uh, which have the potential to lower emissions. Um, so um, thanks, Diana. You certainly outlined a, a great range of um, smaller initiatives that are, are there for, for business. Michael, um, give, there was a little bit of we're probably expecting a little bit more in the budget for supporting business, but there, as Diana has indicated, there has been a range of smaller uh, smaller business measures um, outlined. Do you want to go dive into those in a little bit more detail for our members, please? Yeah, thanks, Susan. Um, hello, everyone. Yeah, so a whole host of things to talk to your clients about, everyone. Um, for those of you who do personal tax return work for your individual clients, uh, the one-off boost to the low middle income tax offset will again mean you'll have lots of clients uh, uh, knocking on your door come 1 July eager to get that personal tax return lodged. Uh, there'll be more money uh, coming back to them if they lodge those returns early. So I know that puts a lot of uh, practitioners under a fair bit of stress. And we'll work with the ATO to try and see if that can be uh, managed. Uh, well, um, the issue about um, uh, business taxpayers, there's two bits here. There's the 120% uh, the deduction for skills training, business skills training. It's important for CAs to try and get a clarity around who can provide that skills training. Certainly um, professional associations like CAA and Z uh, with our um, CA program and other training products will be keen to get involved there and individual firms might be interested as well in this space so we'll be clarifying what is eligible expenditure which attracts the 120 percent business skilling incentive deduction uh, for those of you uh, who've uh, um, been uh, working with clients who have not yet embraced the technological revolution there is this 120 percent deduction as well on offer for uh, you know, digitalization. Now here CAs have uh, an enormous role to play. Again, I'll be uh, working hard to advocate for the 120% deduction to cater for the role that chartered accountants play in introducing and educating their clients about the benefits of technology-based business solutions. We don't want this money just directed to the acquisition of zero products. And they're all great products, don't get me wrong, but this is about educating our clients, uh, not just about getting a 120% deduction for technology spend, but for embracing the business uh, benefits of smarter data, better management reporting, better engagement with your chartered accountant in public practice to do what we do best, which is to help our clients grow their business. So that's an important advocacy point coming out of the budget. Um, the other um, issues are uh, for business are that there is even more money for the ATO to go after multinationals large companies and high wealth individuals. This is a return on investment announcement, which is an every year, Susan, give them ATO more money and uh, the audit activity will result in uh, uh, a return, if you like, in terms of increased tax collections. Um, on this front, um, uh, Susan, I'd just like to mention the post budget breakfast was held this morning at Parliament House. The speakers were Assistant Treasurer, Michael Sukar, and the Shadow Assistant Treasurer, Stephen Jones. I asked the question, have they heard about the current furor uh, 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 about the ATO draft guidance on Section 100A? Both gentlemen said yes, they were well aware of the issue and uh, had received correspondence on the issue. My follow-up question to both of them was, after the election, because there's no time to do anything at the moment, uh, but after the election, would both the coalition and the Labor Party, don't care who wins, be willing to explore tech, uh, technical policy amendments to the law on this Section 100A? I said to them publicly, and we'll try and get a video to all of our fellow CAs, I said to them publicly, we do not want the ATO determining 
you know, what is an ordinary family dealings. Um, we want clarity, we do not want retrospectivity. And both gentlemen from both sides of the political fence said they were aware of concerns about retrospectivity. We are onto it and we will engage fully on this topic. Uh, the submission on 100A, I'm still finalising it. It's upwards of 50 pages. Thank you all for your feedback. The other question uh, from the breakfast, Susan, if I might just hog the microphone a bit longer, came from my friend and colleague, uh, Tony Greco, who's a CA that works for the IPA. Um, Tony got up and asked the Labor Shadow Assistant, uh, Shadow Tre Assistant Treasurer, um, Stephen Jones, what about Labor's 2019 policy, a 2019 policy that it took to the electorate about putting a $3,000 cap on the deductibility of tax agent fees? Now, Stephen Jones gave a, an answer, which is a double negative, but I have to be faithful to what he said. So listen carefully, everyone. First point, Stephen Jones said, Anthony Albanese has said that those 2019 tax policies are not our policy unless Labor says so. Second point, Stephen Jones said, Labor will not be making any statements on the $3,000 cap. And I apologize again for the double negative. This is the way he said it. If we're not making it a policy, to, for the 2020 election, it is not our policy. So um, this is good for us because we've written twice now to the Office of uh, Shadow Treasurer, Dr. Jim Chalmers, and we have not received a, pro, a, a, a reply. It was good to get this up on the record. And again, Susan, we will share this with our, our, our community. Um, so I think that's the main uh, takeaways that I had as Di uh, Youssef has said there wasn't much here for big business uh, or small business for that matter but the skilling and the technology spend are important and by the way people if you haven't noticed giving Small Business Australia a 120% deduction for technology spend and upgrades is code for geez whoever wins government is going to push small business more and more and more into the online world and pre-budget susan as you know we had these announcements payg installments we might adopt a method which is used in the new zealand context of aligning your payg in business installments with actual operating business income the kiwis call it accounting income method Prior to the election, the government announced that the single touch payroll functionality would start to be expanded so that payroll tax reporting will be done via single touch payroll. And members can quite legitimately ask, yeah, what about the benefits for the business? When's that coming? When are they gonna put fringe benefits tax into single touch payroll? When are they going to, um, provide data coming back to the business to help them make better business decisions. All good points, all on board. Um, the excise people, um, the excise cut, watch this space because ACCC will be looking at your service station clients like there's no tomorrow. Passing on the excise cut is very, very important from an ACCC compliance perspective. For your other business clients, CAs will have a a role to play in looking at unit price costing, the impact of lower uh, fuel costs, for example. But I don't think the community generally know um, that a lot of businesses uh, already receive the fuel tax uh, credit. And um, to that extent, we have a bit of an education issue with both your suppliers and your customers, uh, because they'll be saying, well, where's the, where's the you know, how the lower excise uh, costs reflected in your uh, in the prices you pay or the prices you charge. So a little bit of an education uh, uh, work to do there. And as Paul Kelly said, uh, come September, there'll be bad news when the excise jumps back to the current level. And that'll be a problem for the next government. I'll stop there, Susan, because I know there's other people want to um, comment.
I think we might need to just touch base on a couple of issues that, that you've raised there, Michael. Um, the POAG instalment um, announcement also reduced the uplift factor temporarily. It's reduced it from 10% to 2%, I think, for one year. Um, so you'll need to be talking to your clients about that. But in relation to um, the 120% deduction for small business, that generated a bit of chatter. Um, one about whether chartered accountants can really provide that advice as to how to assist businesses identify um, what their digital needs are. And also um, a question arising about when those costs um, can actually hit the tax return because the most the 120% measures for digitalization um, apply from, from tonight. Um, so, but costs which are incurred between today and 30 June of this year get claimed in the following year's tax return, not this year's tax return, which is very different to most budget measures. And that also applies to the 120%. Got a blank there. It was um, digital, and what else was it? The 120% for. Training. Skills training. Yep. Training, thank you. And a similar um, transitional provision applies in that situation as well. Do you have any comments on the um, accountants assisting small businesses with digitalisation, Michael? Only what I've just said that we we want, uh, and this bill has to be introduced with lightning speed and we're monitoring Parliament today and tomorrow, which is the last sitting day, right? Um, um, we're monitoring this carefully and uh, I, I spoke to uh, 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 Bruce Bilson, the uh, Australian Small Business Family Enterprise Ombudsman. I spoke to um, Michael Sucker and Stephen Jones offline after the uh, presentations this morning and made clear that uh, we would be looking closely at the definition of eligible expenditure. Accountants are the advisors of business. Accountants want integrated technology solutions with their business clients. Accountants want to morph, many accounts want to morph into more valuable premium work on business advisory and um, help get this technology to help with, uh, you know, the compliance working, uh, you know, well behind the scenes. So it's an important issue and uh, we're on to it. Paul, um, just going back to you, in your opening remarks, you mentioned there was some legislation going through Parliament this week. Do you, uh, a couple of people asked which pieces were you actually referring to? Were you able to give us some details on that? Yes, I think the three... Uh, key pieces relate to the cost of living adjustment. So those three pieces are the change to the uh, fuel excise. Um, they relate to the $250 cost of living uh, payment, which relates to about 6 million people. And uh, also uh, the changes, the bonus tax uh, rebate. Um, in relation to the low and middle income tax offset and the enhancement of that. Uh, those are three key measures. I understand that they'll all need legislation. I think the government will be keen to uh, press that cause, press that cause. Um, the impression we got last night um, off the record from Labor was that Labor was likely to support those measures. And I think Labor's then signaled that uh, today. It would be particularly surprising if Labor didn't uh, support uh, these measures. Mm. So I think in that sense, um, the main cost of living uh, initiatives in the budget will enjoy bipartisan support, which will be concealed a little bit by a, a very fierce uh, attack from Labor on the budget overall. Thank you. Paul, well, um, just at uh, just at this morning's breakfast, when Stephen Jones was asked a, a couple of questions, he responded that there could be some insights uh, gained from the uh, opposition leaders' budget in reply address on Thursday, and there could be some comments around taxation in that. Not detail not detailed comments, but certainly um, it, was, it was flagged that uh, perhaps Anthony Albanese's budget in reply speech uh, could well be worth listening to. 
I don't think there's any doubt at all that on Thursday night, Anthony Albanese will want to run up of the Labor flag in a pretty strong way by indicating uh, an in principle Labor uh, position, if not uh, details uh, on on Labor uh, policy. I mean, Albanese will want to try and seize the initiative uh, back from the government after the budget. So I, I very much agree with that point, that uh, it's very important to look at what Albanese says on Thursday night. Um, we just had a question come through the chat whether cybersecurity would count as part of the 120% deduction for small business. That was actually named in the budget papers as a, a, an area that small business could claim deductions for. I think cybersecurity is being seen as a, a significant issue and this, the government's actually doing quite a lot of work with small business trying to encourage them to be more cyber aware and more cyber safe. So this 120% tax deduction is really trying to incentivize them to consider that and to protect their business. So yes, they can. Well, Tony, I we've had a, quite a bit on the big picture and about um, personal and business tax, but super was also in the budget, maybe not as much as we were expecting, but the government has extended the half super pension income. Can you please give us Cairns view on this measure? Uh, thanks, Susan, and uh, morning, everyone. Um, so the, the halving uh, pension income payments um, was first introduced way back during the global financial crisis for, I think it ended up being three or four years. Uh, and then it disappeared and it reappeared again uh, once uh, everyone feared the great COVID economic downturn. So it's, it's applied since uh, 1 July 19 and the government has raised the flag of it again. So instead of say someone aged between 65 and 74 at the start of a financial year, instead of paying 5% income on the market value of the assets supporting a pension, you only have to pay uh, two and a half. Uh, and uh, ratcheting, up, uh, those ratcheting up those percentages as you get older. Uh, so it's going to run at least from uh, July 19, as I already said, until June uh, 20, uh, 2023. And we'll see whether or not it, it runs after till then. I, I think the government um, felt their hands were tied given that uh, interest rates are still historically low, especially on deposits. Uh, and it looks like that may continue for some time to come. Uh, obviously, if a, uh, if a super fund gets a lot of its uh, income uh, and, and uh, returns in general from, from equity investments, um, they haven't necessarily suffered uh, such a dramatic, income, a dramatic drop in income. So, but anyway, the government have, have reacted. There have been calls for the government to make these reductions permanent or to adjust the minimum pension drawdowns for people who are older in age, say 80 plus, because the percentages do ratchet up quite quickly once you hit uh, age 80, 85 and so on. Uh, and it does see you lose a lot of your superannuation account balance. Um, these, the raw pension data of pension minimum balance uh, requirements uh, have been around for uh, at least 15 years uh, and probably do need to be reviewed. Um, however, um, the way, of course, actuaries calculate these things is by using average investment performance, which, of course, hardly anyone receives anyway from year to year. Um, so they make, it, they, make adjust, they make assessments about what average investment returns are going to be. And they also make adjustments for um, average life expectancies now, which, have been, which obviously have improved over the last 15 years by um, at least another two or three years for, you know, for, for 65-year-olds, whether it be uh, male or female. Um, and they make so they make a, a, a further improvements for that uh, and average life expectancies. And it, once you factor those into their calculations, it shows that the current drawdown factors uh, get superannuation investors to where the government wants you to be. And where they want superannuants to be later in life is they want you to receive your last dime of super income and then uh, rush headlong to your eternal reward. Um, so um, that's where the government wants you to be. Um, I don't think the community are quite there. Um, it will be interesting to see if the government do adjust these factors for later in life. Uh, I would not be banking on it anytime soon, however. <laughs>
to answer, specifically answer your question, Susan. Right, yeah. Um, having non-arm's length income for super funds amendments has been a big focus of chartered accountants for about um, 12 months now. We had a government announcement last week about likely amendments in this area. What are the next steps? Well, Susan, um, in, uh, in 2018, we had the government make an announcement that it was going to adjust the non-arm's length income measures for super funds to, reduce, to, remove, to remove an anomaly. Uh, and in the then forward estimates, they estimated uh, that that measure would generate over that forward estimates about $20 million in additional tax revenue. Mm -hmm. um, the amendment that they finally passed in 2019 uh, potentially was going to raise in the order of about $70 billion. Uh, so you, I guess you could call that a successful tax measure, couldn't you? That you know something estimated to raise $20 million was going to raise $70 billion. But anyway, rating, rating people's superannuation money for that was, was unattainable. Uh, so we had been pushing the government for some time after the tax office released a ruling about this measure. We've been pushing the government consistently together with other, other industry associations to amend the law. We finally had that announcement last week by, by Senator Hume, and we, we received that with a, a great deal of thanks. Um, what we now need is that we need a public announcement, if possible, or at least a, 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 an indication from the Labor Party that they agree that the law as it stands now and the ATO interpretation uh, does need adjusting uh, and that they are happy for work to commence immediately on that. What we, what we can't really have, we need, we, need this law, we need this law to be amended. We need it a, a met, to be amended from 1 July 18. Uh, and we need to start working with Treasury. Uh, and if we can get bipartisan agreement from that, then we can continue to work behind the scenes with Treasury during the... Um, during the uh, closing of parliament for the election period, because as we know, you know parliament is, uh, is closed down during the caretaker period, uh, and we can continue to work with treasury. So that's, that's what the next step is. The next step is legislative amendment, uh, and we need to work with treasury on that, and we need to do that fairly soon. And I can assure uh, everyone who's on this call that we are working um, as actively as we possibly can on that, um, and uh, it is a key, key issue for us, um, and, uh, and hopefully we will get to a safer place than, than where we stand right now. Right. And I noticed um, sitting next to you in budget lockup, you were looking at the budget papers intensely in relation to the future fund and even nudging me saying, look, the future fund continues to grow. Um, will, it, will it be, it's actually meant to be used in time to fund Commonwealth public service pension liabilities, uh, but you're, do you think the government's going to raid the fund before then? Well, I suppose I suppose there's there's several themes there, Susan. One is to understand what the future fund is for. So the future fund is to fund Commonwealth public sector super liabilities, as 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 you know. Uh, and at the moment, the government estimate that Commonwealth public sector super liabilities stand at around about two hundred eighty billion. Um, the future fund, at December last year, uh, is around about two hundred. Just just north of 200 billion, that they're estimating 208 billion dollars. 31 December 2021. Uh, so there's there's not quite one for one, but it's getting there. Now in uh, 2017, the government said we are going to delay taking money out of the future fund at least until uh, 1 July 2026 or the 26 27 year, which actually takes us beyond the forward estimates. Um, for this current budget. So we, the government still are not showing taking money out of the future fund for this purpose. However, there is a, a glossy document, which is part of the budget papers, which shows the budget potentially returning to surplus around about uh, 2030, 2031. Maybe, maybe Paul has that, that information to hand, but, but it's roughly around about that time, potential for surplus. But in that data, there's not enough for us to see whether or not that actually includes the government taking money out of the future fund to reduce expenditure on uh, payments it's making to public sector super pensions and lump sums and unfunded liabil liabilities and so on. So we're yet to actually see where that sits. But in the very near future, that the future fund is going to become a very important piece to manage the government's outflows. Um, now, of course, if, if we have a dramatic increase in interest rates um, that may come to us because of you know, situations beyond our control, the US economy, Ukraine, so on and so forth, um, what you might find is that the government, the net interest cost on government debt goes up. Uh, and maybe a good way to handle that is for a government 
uh, to, you know, you, you, you can see the future fund being this honeypot where they might say, you know what, we could clear a whole lot of government debt right now by taking all of that money and chucking it out, chucking at all the debt we've gotten. Hey, presto, we've reduced our interest cost. Um, it's a very enticing little pot of money, isn't it? So um, who knows? That's, that's for the future, isn't it? We'll see. Yeah. And the other interest being in superannuation for you is keeping an eye on the intergenerational reports and um, analysing um, the future of Australia. So in the past, you know, the government has permitted strong net my immigration numbers, and that's really helped drive um, GDP growth in Australia. What does the budget forward estimate show now, given the impact of COVID? Well, um, as, as we all know, the, the international borders have been, uh, been closed uh, for many immigrants. Uh, and in the it, let's go back to the 2019-2020 budget. Um, in, the, in those forward estimates for that last pre-COVID budget, the government had forward estimates of, increase, of the population increases of a net 1.7%. Um, so that was both natural increase um, for you know, people born here and, and net deaths and also immigrants. So net 1.7% increase of population going forward. Uh, and I think we had net immigration of you know, in the 300 odd thousand and so on, taking into account everyone coming and going, whether it be students or full-time you know, full immigrants and so on. The current forward estimates is a much lower profile in terms of population increase. Uh, now, my, my back of the envelope calculation shows that we're going to have a population reduction um, over the forward estimates of roughly around about somewhere between four and 500,000 people, that's, that's quite a dramatic decrease in the number of people, isn't it? So, but the government used to try and like to increase the population because it, then it led to GDP increases, which then sort of, you know, helped the bottom line and, you know, created the rivers of gold, you know, potentially over the longer term. Um, they, that seems to have disappeared now. And certainly Michael Sukum kind of said, okay, well, it's going to take us a while to ratchet up the, the immigration rate again to, to its previous numbers. Um, whereas they seem to be getting, they seem to be saying, okay, we're going to correct the budget by encouraging more people into the, into the workforce. Now, whether or not that, uh, those, all those numbers fit together um, is going to be uh, an, important, an important piece going, going forward. Thank you. Well, maybe this is a question um, for Michael, Tony and, and Paul, Diana, if you've got a view as well. I mean, the Treasurer is clearly stated um, in the budget papers as part of his fiscal strategy that the tax to GDP cap of 23.9 is a key element of their strategy and that the imposition of the 23.9% tax cap imposes discipline on the expenditure side of the budget. It certainly deals with the absolute size of the tax take, but it, there is still leave, but it still leaves open the possibility of where and how tax is disposed. So you could have the same overall tax rate, but change the tax basis and how it is collected between people with even with, with that tax cap. With the intergenerational report showing less people of working age as a proportionate population. Can the government afford to leave tax settings unchanged if it, assuming it gets through the next election or the next government um, do? And if not, when do you think tax reform will actually occur? I think that uh, I think you've raised a really a critical issue here. So there are two relevant measures. The first one is, uh, the government's commitment to the 23.9% um, tax tax limit, uh, which means, of course, that this is this is a discipline. This is a discipline on the government. Um, the actual figure is pretty arbitrary, but that's the figure we've got. And the clear message from the government is that it will stick by this figure. And this will be the trigger for further taxation concessions and taxation relief in future years. Uh, and the government needs to stick by that discipline because, because one of its arguments is going to be, of course, that it is more committed to lower taxation than is labor. Uh, and we'll hear a lot about that particular difference during the course of the election campaign. But 
then we've got to look at the spending side of the budget because the spending side of the budget is being transformed. And the budget papers make it clear yet again that at the end of the decade, they predict, they, they predict spending levels as a proportion of GDP to be on 26.5%. Now, this is about two full percentage points higher than where they were before. And this is, uh, according to what the budget's saying, pretty much a permanent change. And it reflects structural changes in the Australian community and ongoing demands on the government and on the budget in terms of aged care, the NDIS, social spending, defence and national security. And essentially what the government is doing is it's accepting this. It's accepting those higher burdens and it's accepting that the Liberal Party will be a higher spending party, a higher spending government. And frankly, according to the measures we've seen before, um, a big government party. The, the question then becomes, of course, the extent to which we can reconcile the spending with the tax and where the bottom line goes, because of course the government is committed to uh, see significant improvements across the bottom line. So essentially, we've got a long-term policy here on the part of the Liberal Party, which makes it a party committed to high spending, taxation restraint, but significant improvements in the budget bottom line. Uh, and a lot of people would argue that that's going to be a very difficult equation to realise. But as we go through the coming decade, there are going to have to be changes in terms of that equation. Well, there have been numerous um, reviews of the ever-growing complex tax and superannuation systems. And we've also had... Um, the Productivity Commission doing five-year reviews on productivity. Um, a lot of these reviews seem to be sitting on certain people's desks, just gathering dust at the moment. Um, do we need another review or how do we get um, the recommendations of these reviews um, activated or debated in the, in the public sphere to take Australia forward? Well, this is one of the issues that uh, we've been addressing for a number of years now. And essentially, the Productivity Commission does its job. It brings out these reviews, whether it's looking at the intergenerational report or whether people are looking at the quality of government spending. But there's tremendous resistance within the political system to tackling these issues. And that resistance remains there. It's going to be very hard to change that. And as uh, I argued in my opening remarks, uh, a little bit mischievously, um, given the progress that Treasury is predicting on the bottom line, you could almost argue that the budget is pretending that we can get a significant fiscal consolidation without having to do the hard work in terms of future spending restraint and future productivity gains. Look, we have a productivity problem. There's no question about that. And it's really tied up with the political system. It's not, um, it's not an economic policy problem. We essentially know the sort of changes we need to bring in in economic terms to generate higher productivity. And this goes to the question of living standards. Uh, we do see contraction in living standards, but it's difficult for either side of politics to actually address this. I think we'll see it addressed in a minor and incremental way in this coming election campaign. As I said in my um, opening uh, statements, Labor will essentially take a five item economic uh, agenda to the coming election. And that is about uh, clean energy policy and uh, investment in renewables, the digital economy, advanced manufacturing, a great emphasis on skills and multinational tax. Now. There are some productivity enhancing measures there, and the same applies to the government. But I don't think we see much appetite at all for significant taxation reform in terms of the components of the system, in terms of easing 
uh, the taxation burden away from personal income tax um, uh, and looking at uh, indirect tax, then looking at uh, property and land taxes. And then, of course, looking at the industrial relations system and getting some uh, significant advances there. So uh, I think the outlook uh, for productivity enhancing reform um, is not inspiring at the moment. And I think progress will be incremental. Susan, if I could just add to what I totally agree with what Paul just said. Um, the, um, the only interesting um, aspect recently was uh, Jim with Shadow Treasury, Dr. Jim Chalmers, indicating that uh, you know he would be prepared to have a dialogue with the state treasurers, state and territory treasurers, if uh, there was a request for some uh, dialogue around tax reform. And this is a line from Joe Hockey's day, the former treasurer, sort of implied that if all the state and territory treasurers line up behind Joe and say, you know, we need some GST, uh, extra GST revenue, then then the federal government might come to the party. But until such time as that sort of uh, political opprobrium uh, is is addressed, uh, that, that, you know, GST reform is not on the table. On, on the multinational um, tax stuff that Paul's mentioned, um, this is a bit esoteric, everyone, but um, my apologies, but we have had discussions with uh, Treasury officials. The OECT, uh, OECD bandwagon, on the global pillar one, pillar two multinational tax, that train is still going. The Ukraine war has not derailed that. Um, obviously, uh, the nations uh, involved will not be keen on sharing tax revenue with uh, Russia or Belarus uh, under current circumstances, but um, Treasury officials envisage a world where the OECD multinational pillar one, pillar two regime can proceed without the involvement uh, or participation of those two nations. Secondly, however, um, over in uh, Washington, D.C., the uh, Republicans are increasingly putting pressure on uh, Janet Yellen, the U.S. Treasury Secretary, to say, to explain more clearly the impact of Pillar 1, Pillar 2 on U.S. companies. And uh, soon, uh, the midterm elections will be held in the U.S., and it's envisaged that uh, President Biden uh, and popularity in the polls will be reflected in uh, uh, in in in, in uh, a vote which gives the Republicans greater control uh, of um, what happens in Congress. So, if we don't get OECD uh, recommendations up, uh, and there's a G20 finance ministers uh, meeting coming up soon, if the Americans fall over, then. Uh, uh, the world is faced with the proliferation of digital services taxes levied on a unilateral basis by individual nations, and that creates a quite a mess uh, tax-wise. But we shall see how this particular uh, project uh, goes um, following the, the G20 discussions coming up. And by the way, they're trying to kick Russia out of the G20 as well. So. Anyway. Yeah, so Cairns uh, pre-budget submission called for funding for Treasury to try and implement these measures and to give them space. I didn't notice anything in the budget, but then it is fairly thick and um, we'll have a look and try and identify what funding, if any, has um, gone to that important project. Um, in Susan, if, if I just may under indulgence, I, I think it's worthwhile saying that in the forward estimates, uh, it's individual PAYG withholding that continues to do the heavy lifting, even we, even allowing for the 24, 25 stage three tax cuts. So in 21-22, 60% of government revenue came from PAYG individual withholding. Uh, in 25-26 forward estimates, they're estimating 63% of government revenue will come from PAYG withholding. That's even allowing for, um, uh, that's even allowing for the, the stage three tax cuts. Uh, and if you look at their numbers, uh, PAYG withholding increases much faster than their expected increase in wages overall. Uh, at well, I shouldn't say much faster, but it is it is faster, and that is what is and that that is you know a major impact on on how they intend to you know continue to repair the bottom line. So it is it is individuals who are doing that heavy lifting, and so even allowing for you know this need for tax reform, there seems to be only. They're only backing one. Ultimately, they're only backing one horse, and that's that's us maintaining our health, our our good physical and mental health, so that we can get out there and earn some income and pay some tax, and save for our retirement. 
in ever increasing amounts. Yeah, correct. I might just add a couple of points there. Um, there are, just to reinforce that point, there are some really devastating graphs uh, and tables uh, in budget paper number one around pages uh, 80, 82, 83 on this precise point uh, about um, income tax withholding forecasts. <laughs> and, uh, they are surging. They are going to, they are really going to surge uh, over the course of the next several years. And they are just fundamental to the improvement in the bottom line. And, um, you know, it's quite stark. When you look at the budget papers, this point is really, I think, one of the outstanding uh, features of the budget. So business shouldn't hope for a corporate tax rate with um, personal income tax rate increasing going forward. Yeah. So just going back to um, Michael and he started talking about BEPS and it reminded me that in, in the week prior to the budget, the government released terms of reference for a board of tax review into the appropriate um, policy framework for the taxation of digital transactions and assets such as crypto. Um, why has this review been announced? And when they announced it, they also mentioned um, that it would be conducted on the basis that it wouldn't increase the overall tax burden. And reviews in the past that have had those sort of requirements put on them have floundered. Do you think that's going to be a restriction on the ability of the Board of Tax to actually come up with an appropriate outcome for this one? Uh, so the Board of Tax has been handed a very difficult project here, Susan. Uh, a couple of uh, backstory comments here. I'm not confident from my conversations with CAs in public practice that the, um, the tax system is adequately monitoring and, uh, and collecting tax from um, transactions in cryptocurrency. The ATO says it has data sharing arrangements, but of course, cryptocurrencies uh, exchanges can be anywhere in the world. And uh, I suspect there is a compliance issue, a big one. Um, Crypto is morphing away from uh, not just Bitcoin, but into uh, other digital uh, assets, uh, safe coins, which try to mirror uh, hedging, if you like, about against the US dollar or whatever. Um, it's morphing into digital, uh, non-fungible non -fungible tokens. I mean, this idea that people buy um, uh, digital assets uh, is an important one. And um, the other big development is that central banks around the world, including our own Reserve Bank of Australia, are starting to look at digital currencies as, um, as a, a backup to the fiat currency, you know, the A dollar, the, the greenback, uh, the pound or whatever. And, um, you know, this is, this is fascinating for the government um, to explore how the central banks can leverage off the technology um, uh, to give you an idea of what the thinking is, colleagues, um, imagine a world where we pay in digital currency at the point of uh, purchase. Uh, you, you tap your card and you pay in digital dollars and the digital currency world enables programming of money. Uh, this is fascinating even for a 63-year-old like me, this idea that you pay for something with programmable money represented by digital currency and all of a sudden that 10% that GST just whizzes off into federal treasury uh, without the need for BAS uh, returns, etc. cetera. Um, similarly, the government could pay uh, welfare recipients uh, uh, their support payments using digital currency straight into their bank accounts on pre-programmed dates. And, um, I know we have a lot of uh, members in the public sector, and uh, but you know you, you've got to think this digitalisation of the economy uh, is going to transform the way that uh, partner, government departments do their business, and then, you know there are interesting ramifications for the size of government if they can start streamlining things. I think so. That's a long-winded story, uh, uh, I guess, but the board of tax uh, has a lot to do on this digital stuff, and um, CAANZ will be reaching out to our members who live and breathe these digital currencies and uh, would like to contribute. Uh, certainly uh, my knowledge on this is limited, but there's fascinating, fascinating angles to um, to explore here. Yeah, one of our members has suggested we should revert back to rum. <laughs> uh, we drink all our profits then. 
Uh, Tony, this year is 30 years since the introduction of the super guarantee charge. It's um, quite a, a milestone. The super system's um, grown considerably in that time and there are many complex rules. What parts of the super system were you hoping to be reviewed or have changes made to in this budget that weren't there? Uh, thank you, Susan. Um, so, I, look, I, I think um, there are many things that we think uh, need to be looked at um, and in no specific order. We, we think the annual contribution caps uh, need to be done away with um, and replaced um, over, after a suitable transition time with lifetime caps uh, because it gets away with the need to do complex administration both at the tax office end, the fund end and also at the individual end uh, for many, many people, it's, it's certainly if we land on the right numbers. Uh, so we would like to get away from those. We also think it's fairer for people who have broken work patterns for, for whatever reason, you know, raising children or, or um, you know, having to stop work for, you know, health reasons or whatever it might be. Uh, so we think, um, and it enable, it may enable it make it easy for people to make catch up contributions, you know, later in life um, uh, as they potentially have more surplus income just, you know, prior to retirement. So we, um, the current contribution cap process is, is based on the concept that we all make regular uh, contributions of a relatively static amount throughout our working lives. Uh, now, the only people I know who fit into that category are the wealthy. Um, I don't know anybody else, to be perfectly frank with you. Um, or, um, so it's, the current system is catering for a very small slither of the, the population. Um, we would also like to see binding death benefit nominations reformed. We think that's a, it's a, it's a mess. Um, we think the total super balance and transfer balance cap system is now five years old. Uh, and a review of that whole process should be um, done by someone, ideally probably by the board of tax. The reason being is that um, the transfer balance cap system was based on the old reasonable benefit limit system and the RBL system was probably not one of the best policies that was ever put in place. Uh, and given we've had it re returned to us in the form of the transfer balance cap, it's probably a good idea to work out whether or not it actually is working this time uh, and whether or not it actually is um, achieving its objectives in, in one form or fashion and is, and is cost effective to administer, um, even allowing for the greater use of technology. Um, they're, they're just a smattering. Obviously, we want gnarly, gnarly amended as, as we've already talked about. So that's just a smattering of some of the things that we would like to see uh, see change, and I think that's probably enough for people to take in take in now. So, so four four key things: we need gnarly, we need annual contribution caps, we need binding death benefit nominations, uh, we need the transfer balance cap looked at, um, and uh, ideally in the not too distant future. Diana, you just heard Tony's wish list um, from a superannuation perspective. Um, given the current um, business environment, what um, what's on the business's wish list for governments? You know, we didn't quite get much in the budget this time, but we're going into the election. What are you going to be wanting to see from either party to assist business? Yeah, so I think we've um, we've already touched on the fact that there's not going to be any significant tax reform for a while. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess probably just to add to that, um, we do have an ageing population. So I think the assumption that um, we're just going to be able to collect pay-as-you-go withholding from personal income taxes probably needs to be considered um, in terms of longer-term perspective. Um, I think a reduction in corporate tax rates um, is something obviously businesses would, would like to see um, because it is actually quite high in comparison to other OECD countries. Um, and uh, I think, of course, that would be welcome to make us more competitive on a um, global landscape and also encourage foreign investment here as well. Um, I guess um, probably one other thing that um, I think is on top of mind for a lot of people at the moment is actually um, electric vehicles and hybrid vehicles. Um, I think they'll become more common in, in fleets um, and therefore it'd be good to see some um, measures announced around that to clarify um, how to depreciate those vehicles and potentially the um, and to clarify the FBT treatment as well. Um, I guess that that's probably one thing I know and particularly um, coming up as a bit of a, a talking point in terms of, for example, even 
um, how do you treat the electricity usage for at-home charging? You know, is that treated as an operating expense or is that just something that's borne by the employee? Um, so there's things like that that I think need to um, be looked at. Um, I guess probably what we didn't see was a continuation of the temporary full expensing um, measures. Um, I, I think a lot of people um, in the business community thought that that was a really good initiative and encouraged businesses to invest. Um, so I think there's probably a little bit of disappointment that um, that wasn't extended. Um, and I guess the same can probably also be said with um, carry back um, of losses, although we do understand that that was a temporary um, temporary measure. Um, I, I think probably the longer term um, reform is necessary to just ensure that we've got an, a more efficient tax system. Yeah, it's interesting that uh, in his, um, interviews in the lead up to the budget, the government officials lamented um, the fact that they couldn't reduce the corporate tax rate for the big end of town and that they said they'd compensated for that by um, other incentives and I think they're referring to the instant asset write-off and R&D. Um, you obviously would support the extension of the instant asset write-off. Are there other um, smaller things they can do to keep Australia competitive from a business perspective? Um, it's a good question. I feel as though we have a lot of compliance um, and I think, I think if we simplified our compliance requirements, that would also make us more competitive. Um, and I mean, you know, there are some measures in the budget around, you know, for example, single touch payroll data and um, automatically populating payroll tax returns and those sort of things. Um, but I think actually just reducing the compliance burden on corporations would really help. I don't know if Michael or Tony have something um, or Paul, if anyone else wants to add to that, but I think we do spend a lot of time complying with ATO, complying with SRO requests, um, and just the amount of resource drain it takes, um, particularly if you've got small finance team or small tax team, um, is, is quite burdensome. And I think people are really aware of that. Uh, well, well, I, I can't comment on, uh, on corporations, Diana, but, but I can comment on superannuation funds. Uh, and the demands of uh, the, the three, three regulators, Tax Office, mm -hmm. APRA and ASIC, in relation to the administration of funds is, is ever increasing. Mm -hmm. uh, it is never going down. Uh, and, you know, whenever they, we were talking about, we were talking to colleagues about this at the, the breakfast this morning that, um, you know, since, uh, since around about 16, well, you know, for, for the last while, we have new laws coming in. We never have laws going out. Uh, and we're just getting larger and larger and larger, uh, and certainly in the superannuation space. And uh, I'm guessing, Michael, um, that's uh, that's the same with uh, with business in business tax in general. No, that's right. Yep. Um, digitalization can be a force for good, or it can be a force for evil. You can use digitalization to make more complexity and just automate things, or you can try and simplify and use digitalization as a driver. And uh, yep. Not quite sure which way some government departments are going. Yeah, I think um, I think um, we got to all got to be very careful with our clients that you know just pressing a button doesn't make um, tax happen. It's, it requires the knowledge of the uh, the law still and the and the way in which uh, it, it should be interpreted. Susan, if I may, just to alert colleagues on the uh, watching this presentation that. Um, the bill is now before Parliament, which um, implements a whole host of things. The uh, the uh, the boost to the low middle income tax offset. Uh, one of our listeners has raised about deductibility of COVID tests. Uh, the bill is now being introduced into Parliament. There must be a sufficient connection between the need for a COVID test and the derivation of accessible income. Substantiation rules apply. Uh, the GDP uplift factor for POYG instalments, the fuel excise tax cut. It's all happening in Canberra, uh, in Parliament House. It's a mad rush uh, to get these um, bills passed uh, before Parliament rises tomorrow for what um, may well be its last sitting day before the election. Thank you, Michael. Um, Paul Kelly has um, had to um, leave us for another appointment, but we appreciate his attendance. Thank you, Paul. But uh, yeah, it's a 
you're busy day in Parliament. I mean, there's only a couple of days left at best um, for anything to happen. And um, it's unlikely that the business tax initiatives will see light of day until after the election. Um, an interesting um, issue is what is deciding what we need as an organisation. What, what are our priorities um, from a legislative perspective, which is going to which we need to talk to politicians about, because there certainly are quite a a lengthy list of announced and unenacted measures now. So, Michael, some of those we mentioned in our pre-budget submission, and um, um, some of them are quite big, and some of them are. Uh, a tinier, but um, we'll certainly be looking at that and talking to politicians over the next couple of weeks. And we'll uh, we'll convey as much as we can through the uh, weekly edition of Tax CAANZ Tax News, um, which is now published every Tuesday. Um, by the way, this COVID test stuff is another hiding to nothing for our tax agents out there in the CA community. Um, uh, you can see so many difficulties in, um, you know, testing the veracity of clients' claims that they bought the test kit uh, for their work-related purposes and not for use by family members for private purposes. So we'll be working with the ATO to come up with some practical guidance here. Um, CAs can't, uh, I don't have the time to chase this particular substantiation burden down every hole. You, we have to trust our clients when they tell us things on this one. These kits uh, cost, well, they started off costing about $15, $30. So, uh, you know, it's uh, it's a can of worms and we want sim simple uh, procedures where tax agents can follow and, and uh, not attract the attention of the ATO. So, Diane, Tony or Michael, do you have any concluding comments that you'd like to make? No, I think everyone's pretty much talked about the sounds of things. Just on the section 100A, I know it's a hot topic uh, for some of the listeners here today. Uh, the submission uh, will be shared uh, probably today, tomorrow, with our CIA and Z Tax Committee for feedback. And uh, to the best I can, I'll share it with our public practice committees as well. It's, uh, it's a hot topic, uh, but um, uh, it, the, the solution may be after the election, uh, and we've asked the ATO to go into caretaker mode on section 100A. They'll probably need the time to read the hundreds of submissions they'll get, so um, that's probably not a bad thing, but uh, engaging with whoever wins government after the election will be very important on section 100A, I think. Mm -hmm. right, well, thank you everyone for taking part in today's um, conversation. We're very grateful for Paul, Michael, Tony and Diana um, for contributing their times and, and thoughts um, to this um, presentation. We've really appreciated your contribution. Um, before everyone leaves the session today, can you please take a moment to fill out our event survey that will appear on the screen because we really appreciate um, your feedback. Our Chartered Accountants experts will continue to provide commentary in the lead up to this year's federal election. And you can follow our budget, um, our information on our budget website hub and in our tax and superannuation newsletters and my CA, all of which um, details will be put through in the chat here. There's also more in store for our members at the Strategic Tax Planning Conference on the 5th and 6th of April. This um, virtual two-day conference will equip you with practical tax planning strategies to effectively guide your clients, taking into consideration the major tax announcements in this year's federal budget. We've posted the, in the chat the links to register for the conference and how to read more on our budget hub. Once again, thank you for joining us today and I hope you've had a great time and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>